Welcome to In Conversation with Megan Dickey and Kimberly Phillips for the launch of the publication Megan Dickey Blue Skies. The recording of this program took place on the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, also known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. We extend our appreciation for the opportunities we have to live and work on these territories and to continually expand our understanding of what it means to be on these lands with reciprocity and respect for those whose families have been its stewards from time immemorial. My name is Nicole Stambridge, Curator of Engagement at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria and Curator for the exhibition Blue Skies, presented by the Gallery in June of 2019. The accompanying publication for this exhibition includes a written contribution from Kimberly Phillips, Director of SFU Galleries in Vancouver, who is also a curator, writer, and educator. Dickey's invitation to Phillips for this text was not to write a curatorial essay, but to provide a response to her work, and the result is a moving and insightful exchange between her words and the sculptures and video work shared by Dickey in this installation, called Blue Skies. The conversation presented here is an extension of that exchange shared in the publication between Dickey and Phillips. I guess the way I use it is I I like the precision to be in the making, uh -huh. but the unpredictability to be in the movement. In the performance. And the performance. So if I make something in a way that I understand its possibilities mm -hmm. for movement, then I don't have to really decide its movement. It's that space between the relationship between me and the object that allows for it to have its own agency and me to have my own agency. And, <laughs> and that thing has to And things to fly in the wind, for example. It's about not working things out so much that they can't transform. But is it, I mean, am I right in thinking that it's the, the rub between the two? Like when you view your work, when you're a, a viewer or a participant in it, um, you can't help but be drawn into the, all of the incredibly fine details that you have worked out in advance mm -hmm. as though you were creating a performance that was then going to go seamlessly. And then there's that moment where you actually start interacting with the object and you have then designed this object so that you can't, is it like that you can't or don't want to um, choreograph its movements or um, orchestrate its movements or understand them in advance so that, that things can have the possibility of falling apart? Yeah, it's... It is that. It is about how they rub up against each other. It's... I see it as being a relationship. So I can't... I'm not interested in deciding for the object mm. every aspect of itself. I want to learn that from the object. And the care involved in that relationship is about watching what it does... Mm -hmm practicing with it, obviously, but knowing that it is, it is kind of a brutal experience when it's stronger than me, mm -hmm. but in most instances, I'm stronger than it. Like it's the, they're objects that I repair all the time, mm -hmm. like that I, and I know its weaknesses and I know, um, how, to, how to let it be itself, I guess. Mm -hmm is what I'm interested in. Um, and so that's also a time-based thing yeah. as well. Like it's a relationship that you have over lengths of time that even an audience wouldn't necessarily know, but that's why video is so important to yeah. you, right? And the way you actually um, edit and build your videos mm -hmm. also speaks to that, like a durational kind of experience or relationship that you have with them. Yeah, you nailed it there with the time. Cause I used to do work that wasn't video based and I think there's something subversive about making something absolutely stunning mm -hmm. and not keeping it in that precious That's state. That's right, yeah. And I'm interested in that because throughout history, women can be mm. thought of as these precious things mm -hmm. to keep in a certain state and to see something get messy mm -hmm. uh, and not retain its composure is really exciting to me mm -hmm. because that's the transformation from what you thought it would be to what it's actually doing. Yeah. And then it makes you just reconsider 
your own biases and things that you've seen before and your own desires even about what you want this to come and that's also why there's really no plots either yeah it's not a narrative no it's not it's just like this repetitive like somewhat disappointment (laughs) but there's disappointment too because there's not well it's extremely frustrating often to watch you in those videos yeah um i was also when you think talking about movement and time and the um the undoing of a set of presumptions around preciousness especially in a gendered sense this morning when i was thinking um, about our conversation i for some reason, I was remembering learning about Duchamp's new descending a staircase. Um, and uh, the professor I had, who, who was hilarious um, and amazing, he was talking about the kind of obscenity of that image, the painted image, um, when it was un- unveiled in Paris, was the fact that it was um, a female body, presumed, presumably, in motion, like moving down a staircase and the kind of jiggly bits that you right bits, i mean yeah. it's not moving i mean first of all movement is it's, it's hard to attain grace um as a moving body in general unless you're yeah. balletic or whatever but also just the sense of like how how a body descends a staircase and the kind of unpredictability of that and where the body parts go and how that was so shocking and in some ways i was thinking about your work something is is happening there and that that you refuse to allow us to sit in this sort of be basking in the in the beauty of the the object it has to be um yeah this motion and this this sort of um uh pull and push and uh, argument with you uh, right. which makes it really fun yeah. yeah and i think seeing women in stasis or moving we're we're used to wanting to see women in a certain way but to see a woman move is also enamoring mm-hmm. Um, to see shine move, mm-hmm. um, glimmer, glimmer yeah. like all those things that that we want, that we're used to um, enjoying. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm trying to mash those together mm-hmm. in a way that stops enjoyment for mm-hmm. parts of it, and then you get back into it again. And then, yeah, so you're left questioning mm-hmm. why and how and because mm-hmm. all of the components are there and we know how we can, you know, we're kind of geared to respond to them. But then you're, yeah, the, the mashing up uh, throws a spanner in it. Yeah. yeah. As soon as I encountered your work, immediately I thought of the idea of the zany and not just any old zany, but the way in which Sean Guy speaks about it in her book, Our Aesthetic Categories, um, which is an amazing text. Um, and the, the thing about this, so she describes the zany uh, as a, uh, an aesthetic category that is of our contemporary condition. And it's one that describes our contemporary condition. And the zany, she says, is all about, it's all about movement. And it's all about affective labor. It's about the sort of um, weird slippage between kind of playfulness or comedy and work. Mm-hmm. And specifically, I think as she points out, uh, when she's looking at it through the lens of a, a kind of post tailor it's like our kind of current uh, capitalist condition, uh, it's about the precarity of labor. Um, and so, you know, when I think about your work, you're obviously, the, the zany is, is always in movement. You know, think about somebody like Lucille Ball as Lucy Ricardo, and she's trying to do these um, these tasks and insert herself into systems, right? As a, you know, as a machinist, as a ballet dancer, as a, um, a hot dog, you know, vendor, etc. And she's constantly um, working too much and too hard in the scenario to, to try to become inconspicuous and become part of the system. And she's failing every time. Um, and though I think what's fascinating to me is the critique in there um, of a number of things. One, uh, the, the idea that um, we're sort of showing the, the zany, I think, throws back into the system, uh, kind of projects back onto itself uh, the thing that is most, you know, its own conditions, essentially, like that we've produced a scenario where all of us are sort of frantically working and constantly um, in a state of precarity, in a state of um, possible injury also. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that the, the movement, uh, which you cannot escape from, is something that's super interesting. Um, and there's also a kind of a gendered critique in there too. I mean, I think the guy talks about um, how 
feminine labor was always sort of understood to be precarious and that was fine, except for now in, in our kind of current conditions, all labor is becoming more precarious. Um, and, uh, and you have to kind of run around constantly to kind of make things work. And you're always struggling to kind of hold the line. Um, and I think in some ways it feels to me that you are, you are operating this way or you're, you're calling up those sets of questions in your work as well. Would you say, would you say that? Totally. Yeah. And I had never, until you wrote the essay, I didn't really consider the term zany. The content of zany mm -hmm. is totally always considered, but I never put a word to it mm -hmm. or a concept um, named it. And yes, it is throwing it back. It's um, for me, it is about showing the struggle. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this last night. I find that we aren't comfortable with seeing something in its actual transition. Mm -hmm. So to me, the zany or the way I try to use the zany is if we see a person and the person be myself performing, move from something that we assume is really controlled and beautiful to look at mm -hmm. in this beautiful landscape. And then all of a sudden, she's not in control or I'm not in control. The, the character's not in control. And we're, we're physically watching her try to struggle. do it, to, yeah. to, to, to struggle. But she's trying, like the character is learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually watching someone learn, mm -hmm. which is a very messy thing mm -hmm. because there's a lot of failure in it. And there's a lot of repetition mm -hmm. and it can sometimes go nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's what I'm, I'm really interested in. And in terms of our contemporary society, I'm interested in movement and uh, the messiness of movement in, in contrast to this idea of human progress being mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. That to learn or to discover or to transform or to become better it's always this way or mm -hmm. this way and with that project you know I a lot of these things were just set up by myself as um, possibilities mm -hmm. like if I if I learn a dance and I, if I have a 14 foot tall pole and if I'm dressed in this way and I'm in this spectacular landscape mm -hmm. what will happen mm -hmm. So there's a messiness with me, too, because I didn't always know what would happen, and it right. was frustrating or it was amazing, depending on the, the location. So, and then with the, the sculptures, I was really adamant of the, about those lying down as well, because once again, to just push against this idea is why does progress always have to be this one direction? And a lot of the modeling that make up that work um, are, are representational from um, monuments that we've seen mm -hmm. before yeah. and our interest in those, those kind of monumental forms as a marker of progression. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it totally is zany. Um, and in, the, in relation to slapstick as well, mm -hmm. how, how uh, Buster Keaton could talk about mm -hmm. what what our own hangups are, yeah, by by doing it over and over again, and and having the failure over and over again, or having the struggle over yeah. and over again. Um, yeah, yeah. I was also thinking when you brought up the sculpture specifically, I was also thinking that you could read the zany in your work in against the grain or in relation to the history of, of sculpture of, of 20th century you know, kind of monumental masculinist mm -hmm. uh, kind of lineage of, of sculpture and sculptors. Um, and I think that's also something that's interesting too is by um, refusing to allow the object to simply stand as a monument um, in, a, in this kind of spectacular landscape. I mean, you're making it impossible for us to kind of like divorce those things. Um, you, you're kind of pressing a button on the history of sculpture too, I think, uh, in our desire for it to be, yeah, this sort of state of grace um, and stasis uh, and uh, and power and this sort of phallic 
um, you know, inevitably <laughs> sort of these objects that are standing upright in the landscape as these sort of like very Western kind of markers. And I, I, I couldn't help but read in your, and I, I think I mentioned this in the text too, you know, you, you're, chosen, you're choosing these landscapes for various reasons. I mean, you're familiar with them yourself as well, but um, you know, these are landscapes that have been witnessed to and have borne the burden of like so much extraction, yeah. so much violence, so much um, arrogance, right? Uh, and to kind of call up that in, a, in some aspects in your dress, but also in this sort of, uh, you know, the history of sculpture is very much a part of all of that arrogance. Yeah, um, and I think bringing those sculptures into movement and struggling with them and having this kind of um, dynamic relationship with them, as you say, like you're learning and you're moving together, really undermines a, a set of presumptions around how not just sculpture, but sculptors work. Right. And how when something is finished and complete and like presented to the world and there forever in a set in a, yeah. in a sort of moment of, you know, place of stasis. Yeah. Well, and it, it's me grappling with myself in the place of sculpture uh -huh. as well, because I don't know. I don't remember when I said that I was a sculptor. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I, that's a really cool, good question. Um, what happened that? And but having to constantly claim that space because mm -hmm. it's so easy for my work to be squeezed out, to be squeezed out, especially since I work with um, textiles and jewelry based kind of processes and um, the feminine form and movement. It's very easy to be like, Oh, are you still a sculptor? <laughs> yeah. But you know, in, I, I'd like to think when, like when I was performing that, and, you know, talking about her histories of um, terrible things um, in relation to Indigenous peoples and the lands that we call our home. When I was there in those spaces, all, you know, all by myself with mm -hmm. this object. So conspicuous. Yeah. It... You know, you think about those things, of course. I mean, just to be there and looking at the landscape is is ridiculous. And um, there's a lot of gratitude there. But while I was doing that, it's like I'm, I'm there and I'm doing this, but it's temporary. Mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm here to have this conversation with this space and like assert myself at that same time. But it's a transitional thing mm -hmm. once again it's not it's not it's, like smithson no, and like no land i don't want that to you're not be, carving stuff no. out to be forever yeah mm -hmm. that's interesting and and so that is deli i mean that's deliberate that's on your deliberate, part whether or not it yeah, developed in that it that things are temporal mm -hmm. or that you know a lot of my work doesn't last a long time because it's been used in performances mm -hmm. and stuff like that but and the last thing i like to say in terms of that zany thing like the zaniest to me, the zaniest part, and that was so gratifying, and, and if I could be Lucille Ball, that, so this is what I would feel, is the whole ridiculousness of the phallic thing, and that this is a shape that we should aspire to, to, to have this massive form, and the only thing that was keeping it up was me. Is, was hilarious mm -hmm. to me and, and to feel it too, yeah. like to feel it. Oh my God, I'm keeping, I'm trying to keep up masculinity. Like, this is really weird. <laughs> Especially because it's like, and it was, and it, was, and it felt like I felt it too because of where the holster was. And it was, it was hilarious and strange and, is it empathetic then in that way? Do you did you find? I did, did you have empathy? some. I did have some empathy, like you know that Seinfeld um, <laughs> thing where Elaine's like, I don't know how you guys walk around with those things. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, yeah, you can't. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Like to try and keep up that masculinity is a lot of work. It's a, a lot, lot of labor of extension, a lot of affective and other labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's, oh that's, that's, I talked about that. Genius. That's so good. Oh. <laughs> I think it's.
ties back into Zadie, too. Like, I mean, hanging on is about struggling right. or trying to survive the struggle. Yeah, it's about survival. Uh, and to help others try to survive the struggle. And... And that is also linked to this freneticness of labor and work mm-hmm. and, and can um, lead to the zany. I mean, I just thought of something too. Yeah. It's like, do you think that there's, is that performance then in, in your work, which we would call zany in some respects, is that an act of empathy? Because I'm thinking about these performances by these comedic geniuses like Charlie Chaplin, Lucille Ball, etc., cetera, um, Buster Keaton, there is something about, you know, in performing the kind of ridiculous failures uh, constantly um, of being in the modern world, um, it, it, it offers you, the viewer, it, it signals that it's okay to fail. Like, it's not right. possible to succeed. Or it may be, like, at least I'm not doing as badly as them, right? So is there, do you find, is there an element of, of that? I mean, is that, could that be considered empathy? And would, would you argue that, is that there, do you think, in your work? It's there. I, I would say maybe I might call it vulnerability. Uh-huh. I'm being vulnerable. Someone might be feeling empathetic for my for vulnerability. Um, be, and I want to be vulnerable. And it's, it's interesting because you can't unlink all these questions that mm-hmm. we're talking about. I want to be vulnerable to show that I'm in transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I was strong, I would have transitioned, <laughs> right? right, right, right. <laughs> I'm not... And arrived. Yeah, I would have arrived. Yeah. I would have finished. Um, and that's why nothing is ever complete in the movements either. I mean, hanging on... I'm, I'm interested in us seeing that as a powerful thing. Mm-hmm. And same with vulnerability, that... If you are able to put yourself in this situation of uncertainty and survive, mm-hmm. uh, there's a power to that. Like there's a power to knowing that you can go through ups and downs and you can go through turmoil and that you have a confidence in yourself to hang on mm-hmm. while you're doing it. I mean, it's also depleting at the same time. But I think in general, most of us are interested in seeing someone not be perfect mm-hmm. and not and be closer to themselves, mm-hmm. the person that's viewing. So to show vulnerability and to show that you're trying still while you're in this chaotic state, is somewhat hopeful, I guess. Yeah, I was thinking it, that there's an optimism there, maybe. Um, I mean, I was also wondering, when I was thinking about this question myself, uh, how do you, there's a different, I mean, there's hanging on because because you need to survive and it's the only thing you can do. And um, in some ways, like you could argue, hanging on means that you're simply allowing the system to perpetuate, right, um, the conditions that are so depleting mm-hmm. to, to continue. But there's also a way, I mean, I think maybe this is what artists are capable of doing when they're working really well, is that you're, you're demonstrating, you call attention, you bring it into such high relief, the conditions around which we are working. So that's why the seal ball is right. so amazing, right, is that um, everything snaps into kind of clarity um, not the ridiculousness of her, but the ridiculousness of the system in which she has to insert herself in order to survive. Um, and I mean, your work is doing that too, I think, in some ways. So it is like, it's a mode, um, and I, I guess in some way I'm trying to get at this at the end of one of those texts, is like, it, it's a way of not only a, um, you know, a dr- indicating the system itself, but also throwing a bit of a spanner into the works. So you're, you're kind of... Um, subverting something or um, undermining it and by by actually calling it into view in a way that um, otherwise we wouldn't necessarily see. I mean, it's it's funny where my head went because when, when you asked if I would write for this beautiful book and the first thing you told me was like, please don't write a curatorial essay. Yeah. <laughs> don't Don't write a straight text. Just respond creatively right. and of course that's a terrifying <laughs> prospect 
or it felt that way to me. <laughs> okay. um, because how do you, I mean, I don't know whether any other writer feels this, but I, I, it's the things that I enjoy writing about are the ones that are really difficult to write about, that you have a hard time finding words to rub together, that, that, that it takes a lot of work to kind of find the right words to, um, yeah, just actually come anywhere close to the experience of the work. And for some reason, as I sat with that invitation, I, the, it, it came to me just, I don't know, out of nowhere, I was just thinking about my grandmother. Um, and maybe it was because, I mean, you and I had talked about, we had talked about jewelry and we talked about being women and we had talked about lineage and um, inheritances that you, that you have, that you're burdened with. Um, you know, we all have those. Uh, and, it, and I, yeah, I just, I, I, for some reason went there and was thinking about other ways that I've witnessed women holding things up, <laughs> you know, and in, for a sort of long durations, like for their whole lives, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the way they take on roles, I was thinking about your, your costumes, right? This sort of incredible care that you bring to the garments that you, that you perform in, um, and how, for many of the women who are older than me in my family that I that I've observed like that is a performance and all of those choices are so carefully um yeah brought together and and when I thought about my grandmother in relation to your work it was like well I was thinking of her trying to find ways to be seen um by dressing in a way which uh was really too ostentatious too too glimmering, too encrusted with stuff, with jewels and things. It was all costume jewelry, of course. Um, but it was, it was too much for her, her position, her place. But it was really the only, it was really the only voice maybe that she had. Um, and then I also had a conversation with another artist who I, I love dearly, Vanessa Brown, based in Vancouver. And she, she makes work, she's a sculptor also, you know her work. She works with steel often, um, and she's very interested in like the history of sculpture, similarly to your you in the in the t sense that it's been such a masculinist enterprise. Um, and she works with very heavy, hard materials, but she she thinks about the history of jewelry, um, and especially in nomadic societies where that's how wealth was often uh, bestowed or carried forward, and and privileges and stories were handed down through through objects that were worn. Um, and could be packed up and carried with you when you need to go and would go down through the natural lineal line. Um, so somehow those things sort of were called up for me. Um, but I don't know, how did you read it? Like, how did you read that text? <laughs> well, I instantly thought of that first studio visit we had a few years ago. And I remember after I drove you to the next studio visit and talked to somebody and they said, what was it like? I'm like, I didn't have to explain what it was like to be a woman and my interests mm -hmm. to Kimberly. It was okay to have those interests <laughs> and okay to think the way I thought about our material world or what I'm interested in material world. And when I read the essay, it's hard to remember how I felt at the time because I had a lot of things going on, but it was like you got it even deeper than I had imagined. Hmm. Um, it was, you know, I think that my interest in making sculpture comes from my interest in metals, mm -hmm. like, and metals as a small piece of material that is lasting, that can be attached to the body in a very discreet way mm -hmm. or a very, um, Wow. Conspicuous way. Yeah, mm -hmm. in a conspicuous way. And so when I make work, I almost always do that. I almost give my sculptures jewelry mm -hmm. by just giving it a, a little edge them. of brass or, or um, aluminum or steel. And it is, it is about the fineness of it and the tension and the care that goes in fineness. Um, but it is a language that is somewhat, you know, in our contemporary society, and maybe less now, but it used to just be an internal language of, for women. Mm -hmm. And the memories that I have associated with, you know, every piece of jewelry that my mom owns, 
Like, I, I know every piece. Mm-hmm. There are stories around yeah, that. Yeah, or, or just the memories of going into the jewelry box mm-hmm. and that imagined of state as a young person. But still, you know, like, just last summer, my mom sent me a pin of hers that I'd always loved. And, like, it was way better than any other gift just because mm-hmm. she knew my attachment to it. I knew her relationship with it. And now we're, t- we're linked with that mm-hmm. one piece. It's just a very special thing. Like, and I know I've tried to talk to others about what it is about jewelry and its power. It's, only, it's almost like language can't express its history and its meaning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even when you see it on the Antiques Roadshow, how, like, a really ugly chair is worth ten times more than Mm -hmm. a a ruby ring, because maybe it's too personal Mm -hmm. to have monetary value on, like, a chair. So it's, I guess it's, yeah, so I was really touched by that and inspired by it, too, that, that that could be written about. I guess because we don't, You know, there's fashion history, Mm -hmm. but we're not reading about jewelry in contemporary art unless Mm -hmm. the artist instigates it, like like Vanessa. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not a starting point for many things, many points of discussion. Because it's I, maybe par- in part because it's seen as peripheral or a, an accessory, like the, even the notion accessory. of an accessory, right? right? Something you don um to finish. It's not the main event. And again, like there you go with the whole um, the kind of centrism and sets of presumptions around um, what is what is worth our uh, our gaze and what is worth spending time um, in. What's it worth investing in? I mean, the chair is the is the thing rather than the the set of earrings or whatever. Um, but it is interesting to think, I mean, I can think of many different artists now who are considering that which is like just the wallpaper on the wall, like set, uh, things on the background that in fact, like we feel they're innocuous or we, they seem innocent or, um, uh, you know, inconspicuous, but in fact they tell, they, they actually draw together so many intense histories and they, um, they tell the story in the marginalia of things mm-hmm. that otherwise we don't hear. So when you attend to them and I think maybe yeah, I have noticed that with your sculptures. Like you will, you will take the extra time to finish them in a particular way. And it's like sometimes it's just this, this edge. Yeah. Um, and you, did, you could easily have not done that. It's almost only for, it feels like it's for you. Most likely for me. <laughs> but, but also it is, it is a signal, right, to, to attend to those edges um, that otherwise get, that maybe get lost. Mm-hmm. Because the edge is actually where, I mean, the edge is where you're working. I think you're always working on that edge. At the edge of sculpture, at the edge of performance, at the edge of theater, you know, these things. So, um, and that's where you actually find, like, that's where you pick up all the interesting bits um, is when you attend to that. 